I'm Lucas Arinder of the Western Gazette, and welcome to the 2023 USC presidential debate between Nika Bajaj and Sunday Ajak. I'm coming to this role not only with a gut understanding of how the USC advocates on behalf of you, but also how the USC puts on large-scale concerts and fun things like bringing Kelly here. Coming from an affiliate, I bring about a new perspective, a new image, a new change within the USC, and some truth to when it comes to bridging the gap between affiliates, between cultural groups, between different spaces on campus that aren't seen. Nika, in your platform, you propose expanding mental health coverage under Purple Care from $750 to $1,000. In order to accommodate increasing mental health coverage, the USC will likely need to either decrease health coverage in other areas or increase student fees. What areas of purple care do you propose defunding or will students be paying more? There would be no areas that would be defunded. This is actually something that is already being discussed by the Purple Care Trust. The reality is it was going to be implemented this year, but instead, because of the fact that Purple Care is already being utilized very much more than our insurance company expected, we could not include it under the 7% regulated increase per year. We can include it next year at no direct increased cost to students. It's a mental health epidemic on this campus, and students need to be able to get the help that they deserve. Sunday, in your platform, you propose adding the Rideshare app Wilma, which is designed for women and gender diverse people, uh, to the USC Now app. Wilma works similar to Uber and Lyft, but the $15 monthly subscription in addition to the ride hail fees. Will the USC cover this subscription, or will Wilma waive it for students? So in speaking with co-founder Mary Morrison, she was very, very adamant of bringing this service to the, to the USC and making it an adamant service for students to use. So she is very willing to cover many of the costs when it comes to subscriptions. And she was really, really um, happy to do this, is provide the USC with a discounted rate, providing a universal service for uh, students to use at a discounted rate. Looking at your qualifi qualifications and those of your opponent, what makes you the better candidate? I do not think I'm better than anyone. I do not think I'm better than Nika. I do not think I am better than any other student who ever wants to run for USC president. What I am going to say to you is I have a certain set of beliefs that are unique. I will not answer that question and say, I think I'm better than her because of this. Impossible. That's not me, and that's not who I'm born to be. By no means do I think I'm better than anyone, but I do think that I'm coming into this role with the experience on both sides of the USC, internally and externally. You know, I come in day one, I don't have as much of a learning curve as someone who's been, you know, a poster boy the past four years. So you both have very different approaches to Purple Fest. Sunday, you pitch a larger scale concert on homecoming weekend. Nika, you propose a welcome back week with a concert geared towards upper year students who missed out on traditional week. Explain why your plan is better. I don't think necessarily my plan is better, but I will say it's more feasible in the sense that financially it makes more sense to have Purple Fest the week after a week. One of the things I want to do is include a lot of safety measures on Purple Fest and include some of the measures that were brought forth with a week and then bring them to Purple Fest. And I do I want to do it in a manner that includes the care hubs that are used with the USC. The care hubs will actually already be there if a week just happened. So we can keep those set up under my plan. What is something on your opponent's platform that you disagree with and what would you do differently? I really like a lot of the aspects of Sunday's platform. I just don't think there's the research and the specific plans to get them done. One of the things that she asserts is that it'd be really cost effective during Purple Fest to keep the stage up, but I don't think many students know that that, that stage costs approximately $10,000 to keep a day. So I don't understand how it'd be typically feasible to keep the stage up during a week, especially when it comes at the, at the cost of the production crew and them being overworked. It actually is more cost effective because we could hold the programming either on the Sunday or the Saturday and have a full concert for everyone included. It definitely is more cost effective and I've run the numbers. I don't think the cost effectiveness is the only approach you need to take with this. You need to look at the people that you're affecting, i.e. the production crew that you're looking to overwork. And one of the things I do also think you should mention is that what is the incentive for students to then come to Purple Fest right after a week? Purple Fest will be for second, third, and fourth years. We're doing, you know, welcome back week programming. What about the production crew? How are you gonna, how are you gonna support them? I think overtime pay would be a great way to go about that. There will be people who haven't worked in days because it's a shift-based system who we can then employ. My question is, have you spoken to production crew or is this an assumption that you're trying to assert? No, but I have spoken directly to the people that employ them. I think there's a big difference between an employer and an employee. However, that's just my opinion. You both dedicate significant portions of your platform to affordable student housing. 
Sunday, you propose advocating for the provincial government to create a rent cap for student housing. Nika, you propose advocating for new zoning bylaws to increase high density housing. Why is your plan more feasible than your opponent's? USC president has absolutely no ability to affect rent in London, Ontario, and I really want everyone to understand that. Everything that we do as a USC president is simply advocacy based. So one of the things I do want to take my approach at least is from a top-down perspective. Understanding how it works when it comes to how what students need on the on the provincial level as well as the municipal level, and then talking exactly to the to the um, to the counselors in all of the wards that all student housing exists in. So first of all, we're looking at building more housing on campus to help to relieve some of the stress on the housing market. The thing is, the money is already there. If you look at Western's long-term planning and financial documents, there's over $120 million in long-term debentures that have been set aside for housing on campus. It's just a matter of talking to the right people and getting those conversations going. What makes yours more feasible than mine? Remove all the rhetoric. That the money is already there. Do you don't control the money, though? I don't control the money, but Western has already made it a priority. The money is set aside. It's just a matter of making it a priority. So realistically, it's simply advocacy-based, which is, which is exactly what I said. What I think you fail to understand is that if we were to implement a rent cap at Western, that's a rent cap at every university across this, this, the province of Ontario. It's simply not financially feasible. What I'm talking about is money that's already been set aside, plans that are already in place, and simply speeding them up. EDID is extremely important here at Western. What do you fundamentally think decolonization is and what does decolonization look like at Western? Colonization is rampant across all different avenues on campus. It's about putting that leadership back in the individuals who come from these cultures, who come from these spaces where they're not typically seen. I don't think that by any means decolonization or EDI is a platform pillar. I think it's something that we interweave into everything that we do. Those voices need to be present at the table and we need to, to do a better job incorporating those communities in our leadership. There are clubs that have, that have views which we see as incompatible with that, with that of the university, such as those that openly support things like anti-abortion. This affiliation means they get, they get access to things like room bookings, financial support from the USC, or even just get recognized at the club week. I come from the Western Debate Society. We bring so much prestige to the name of Western internationally and all over North America, but how has the USC responded? They've told us to, they couldn't even give us rooms, not much less funding. How do you plan to reconcile this difference in how the USC addresses different types of clubs, and what will you do for unaffiliated clubs? The USC is not God, you know. I don't, I don't make the right and wrong decisions on opinions by any means. And I don't think it's the point of the USC to say, you know, this is a right opinion, and this is a wrong opinion, and this club should exist, and this club shouldn't exist. I think as long as a pro-life club is not by any means influencing anyone's day-to-day -day student experience, there's no graphic imagery, etc., then they should be able to continue to exist. Like I mentioned earlier, there needs to be a holistic review of the club system, looking at what is the process for ratifying a club, and how can we ensure that clubs like yourself that are doing a lot to further Western's name and going out into the community and making a, a, a change are part of the USC. I've been a part of many clubs on campus that do go unrecognized by the USC, and I think it's one of the biggest faults that the USC has. So one of the things that I do want to do is introduce a different system to the club's, to the club's ratification process. It's going to be on a two-tier basis where we recognize clubs that go through a very lengthy ratification process but we do also have a different system for smaller clubs much like the base society to have a second tier ratification process where they're able to access resources like room bookings but simply lose out of USC funding. I was wondering how you guys plan to address affordability on campus. So the first thing that we have is what I'm calling a roundup program at this boat. So in the morning when you're going through and buying your three dollar bagel you can round it up to four dollars and all of that money will go towards supporting the food bank. So I want to start a short-term rental laptop or laptop rental system through the UC USC where you uh, are able to you know if your laptop breaks or if you need a replacement and it's going to cost you thousands of dollars you're able to get a short-term laptop rental. Starting a potential grant system where we could provide you a few hundred dollars so that you can get involved on a merit basis would be an incredible way to support students who are struggling with affordability. Realistically, there's a lot of different avenues on campus that do help students when it comes to affordability. Just simply, students simply don't know that it exists. So when it comes to affordability, I feel as if providing that information towards students and having it in a holistic approach where it's like, we have these resources on campus, you can use them to help you with your affordability. That is, a, that is what I believe when it comes down to helping students with that affordability on campus. 
What are the actionable, tangible steps you plan to implement in order to implement a preventative, survivor-centric approach to anti-gender-based sexual violence? We're focusing on that partnership with Wilma, providing that service. It's a service that allows only women to pick up women, and it's one of the proactive ways that we're trying to address sexual and gender-based violence. One of the reactive ways is we've formed a partnership with ANOVA with their Map My Experience. So firstly, sexual and gender-based violence is not just a woman's issue. It's an everyone issue. And they are only training first years in consent education and not bystander intervention training. I want to make sure that all students and professors across campus are trained in these programs. I want to look at what I'm calling immediate reactory measures. So things like the fact that last year, Western made a partnership with St. Joseph's Hospital, where at any time you can call their care center and receive a rape kit in an area that you're comfortable in. How will both of you ensure every student, no matter where they come from on campus, will be able to feel feeling supported in running a competitive campaign when this year there were already several students who didn't have a background coming from a USC position that experienced extreme difficulties submitting their nomination, giving them a clear disadvantage from the very beginning. So what Omar is referring to is his own disqualification from this race. And I'd like to first address the fact that there are a lot of barriers to entry from the USC. And so one of the ways that we talk about in my platform doing that is the aspects of mentorship. So I'd like to utilize the USC's alumni network to ensure that students from all backgrounds, like you've mentioned, feel comfortable and feel ready to take on this position. Coming into first year, one of the biggest things I noticed is that when I saw the USC, there was a certain image that many people don't ascribe to. And what that does for many people on campus is it takes away their confidence in the leadership within them. This is simply a matter of having that representation for people on campus that don't really go see. That's it. That's the bottom line. It's not a matter of saying we're going to have this, we're going to have this mentorship program. It's not that. And that concludes our 2023 USC presidential debate. Thank you candidates for joining us and thank you for those watching from home. Remember to go vote. Cast your ballot Tuesday, February 7th. It's Friday, February 10th. Election results will be announced on the evening of Monday, February 13th. Thank you all.